God, thank you for these truths we have sung to whet our appetites for what is to come. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Extraordinary account of her death, heaven, angels, and life again. A true story. 90 minutes in heaven. A true story of death and life. Nine days in heaven. 23 minutes in hell. One man's story about what he saw, heard, and felt in that place of torment. Heaven is for real. Of course, there's a movie coming out about that. And the boy who came back from heaven. Uh, Tim Challies, the blogger, has called this genre of books heavenly tourism. Um, been scanning one of them this week, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. It's the story by Alex Malarkey. He was six years old when he and his dad were in a violent car accident. He spent two months in a coma, went to heaven, came back, and wrote a book about it, told us all about it. Um, and if you read this book, you discover that what he describes about heaven doesn't line up with what the Bible says about heaven. Uh, later, Alex Malarkey confessed to have never read his Bible before that experience, and lied about his experiences, and actually wrote a retraction and sent it to the publishers and asked them to pull the book off the shelves. And he and his mother have spent the rest of their time since that book come out, came out, uh, trying to tell the world that it was all fiction. And, and we can put all of those titles I just read to you in that same category. They're all fiction. And, and that fiction can come from any number of sources we won't delve into this morning. But we need to know that the Bible tells us a lot about heaven. The Bible tells us more about heaven than we can possibly cover in a weekend like this. And so there is not really a need to go outside of our Bible to invent realities about what we're going to look forward to. There's no need to speculate. And so our task this weekend is to examine what does the Bible say about our future heavenly home. And if I could do some things, I'd love to dispense with some misconceptions about heaven. I want to dispense with the notion that when you get there, you're going to be handed a robe and some sheep, sheep music, sheet music, <laughs> and a harp, and you're going to be assigned a cloud for you to sit upon and strum a harp according to the sheet music forever and ever and ever. That's not what's going to happen. I, I want to dispel from your mind the idea that uh, you need to, to, to take that uh, old vision of a church service where you're sitting on a hard wooden pew and listening to some <laughs> man drone on and on and on about things you don't understand, and, and, and that's what you're going to experience forever and ever. Your worst view of church multiplied by infinity. 
I want to dispense with the idea that heaven is somehow non-relational. That, that you just get uh, sucked up into the ether, into an unknowing, semi-conscious state where things are blurry and you don't really relate to people and friendships are no more. Sometimes we think that, that heaven is the departure from things we hold most dear here, like people. Nothing could be further from the truth. Heaven will, in fact, be the most intimate, relational experience that you will ever have. I want to dispense with the idea that heaven is some sort of non-corporeal, non-physical, non-material, intangible existence. Heaven is far from that. Heaven is a real, literal place where believers go to enjoy the very presence of God and the redeemed for all of eternity in glorified bodies on a new earth in the new universe in a very physical state. I want to dispense with the idea that heaven is unrelated to things we experience here. Heaven is not unrelated to the kinds of things we experience here. But we'll talk about those in detail this weekend. I want to dispense with the idea that in heaven uh, there will be some sort of impersonality to your relationships, that you will be lost in the crowd uh, with, with all of the uh, myriads and myriads of angels and the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the redeemed saints from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people, will you somehow just be one of the many? And the truth is, heaven will be very personal very personally relational. I want to dispense with the idea that heaven is the extension of your favorite pastime. It's not. Um, let's just talk about some of those for a moment. I, I, I know one of them. I talked to Allie about this this week. I'm going to out you. I'm sorry. I know you were. So... Disneyland is a favorite thing. Um, missed out on an opportunity to do a favorite thing like Disneyland, but man, I got to organize. Allie loves to organize. <laughs> favorite pastime. I asked her, Allie, so if, if you were to a, able to organize everything just the way you always dreamed and, and get everything right in its spot so you know where everything is, everything's accessible, visible, and it looks great, and it's just perfect. Um, would you sit down and say, oh, it's all organized? And she said, no, I, I need to find something else to organize. <laughs> Favorite pastimes? Horses. What was it? Horses. They're in Revelation. You know what? <laughs>
Ellie, you would even get tired of organizing. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a single pastime that you could extend into eternity future that would satisfy, that, that, that would be the kind of thing that would quench thirst and amplify thirst for more quenching thirst that amplifies thirst that quenches thirst that amplifies thirst. There is nothing like that. Which is why when, you know, when, when people think, oh, uh, heaven is whatever my favorite thing to do here. That's what heaven's going to be like. No, 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 it won't be. And, and praise God it will not be. And, and if there's one notion I would love to dispense from all of our minds and hearts this weekend about heaven, it is the thought that heaven will be boring. We must get rid of that thought altogether. It is impossible that heaven will be boring because of what heaven is. Knowing about heaven, knowing about eternal life, according to Jesus in John 17, 3, is knowing him. Knowing God. And the one whom he sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. Getting to know the fullness of the infinite nature of our Trinitarian God who, by the way, is the inventor and dispenser of all of those pastimes, and the inventor and dispenser of your capacity to enjoy all of those pastimes, God who created fun and created your appetite for fun, is the one who dwells in heaven as a living fountain who gives and gives and gives from himself to his creatures ad infinitum. Forever and ever and ever, as Jonathan Edwards put it, an <coughs> ever-increasing delight. Jonathan Edwards said, this is why day two in heaven is better than day one. Day three is better than day two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's impossible for you with a finite mind to be bored by the infinite. It's impossible. So heaven will not be boring. Whatever we've projected into heaven, whatever we've thought about it, it, it will not be boring. The reality is, he heaven is not a self-determined state. Right? The Muslims have their idea of what heaven is. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses have their idea. The Mormons and people have different religions and different people say, oh, heaven is going to be such and such. As if they could self-determine that. Your eternal future is not determined by you any more than your present existence is determined by you. Right? If you could sprout wings and fly, you might. Um, there are a lot of things we would like to do if we could just speak them into existence. How arrogant for us who can't change our circumstances here to think that we can determine them there. And by the way, anything you or I could come up with would be infinitely awful compared to what God has in store for those who live. Fundamental principle for this weekend is heaven is the home for heaven's citizens. You have to belong to God. You, you have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You have to be in Christ. And if you're here this weekend, you're going to be hearing a lot about heaven. I do not want you to think that heaven is your home if Jesus does not have a home in you. And if you're here this weekend and, and you're thinking, well, heaven sounds great, but you have not repented, turned away from who you are, surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, experienced new birth and forgiveness of sin, and then let me tell you, meeting God face to face will not be good. Heaven is not for you. And if you're curious about how to go from being under God's abiding wrath, destined for an eternity, under his anger, to move from that into being a citizen of heaven, there are a lot of ladies around you this weekend who would love to talk to you about how you can know God personally. You must do that. Life is short. Hell is real. Heaven is home. For those who love Jesus. Take an opportunity this week to be introduced to him. 
Turn the page. Session two. Wasn't that great? Session one was so good. Session two. Title of the page should say the vocabulary of heaven. The vocabulary of heaven. Um, if, if you just search your Bible for the word heaven, you're going to find a number of different realities described by the word heaven. So we don't just want to slot our favorite definition into the word and say, aha, now I know what it means. We're going to get really confused when we do that. We're going to allow the context of any passage of scripture to help us understand what is meant by the word heaven. Uh, so let's start in Genesis 1.1. It should be on page one of your Bible or somewhere near page one. What is the first verse of God's self-disclosure? This book in our hands, this Bible. What does the first verse say? How does God introduce himself? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. Uh, if you want to learn a technical Hebrew grammatical term, uh, this is a merism. Heavens and earth. It's like saying from A to Z. It, it's an all-inclusive statement from one end to the other. Uh, to say that God created the heavens and the earth means he created everything. That is the universe. Everything that is created. Not only in the physical universe, but in the sort of extra-dimensional, spiritual side of things. So Satan, angels, all these kinds of things that are uh, sometimes take on physical form, but normally exist merely in spiritual form. They are created beings. They are not uh, eternally existent into the past. They have a starting point. And God created all of them. And when you see the word heavens, when it's paired with heavens and the earth, typically it simply means the universe. And often, the physical universe. From Earth and our solar system, uh, to our galaxy, to the empty space, all the way to the next galaxy over, and the hundreds of billions of galaxies out there into space, all the way to the pulsars and the quasars and the plasma at the farthest reaches of what we can detect. God created all of that, spoken into existence, Filled it with uh, animated life, lights, etc. in six days. Let's see another use of the word heaven in verse 8. Genesis 1-8. God called the expanse heaven. God called the expanse heaven. What is this expanse? Um, just the, the disk that is visible from our perspective above us. Sometimes that disk is blue. Sometimes that disc is brown in Arizona and uh, And sometimes it's black. Right? And, and, and all of that sometimes we call sky or the skies. Right? Can we talk about the stars in the sky? Right? Are the stars in our atmosphere? No, they're, they're way out there. Um, I don't know if you've ever um, done the, the thing where you put your thumb over the moon, like the, like the movie. And you go, wow, the moon is really far away. It's really interesting when you see a shooting star, which is a, a meteorite, just a piece of dust or a little rock burning up as it comes into our atmosphere, and you get a sense of the perspective. Oh, this, this little shooting spark is like right here in our atmosphere. And those stars are really far away. And you start to get the scale of this. But all of it's called sky. All of it's called the expanse. The stars are said to be in the sky, and the birds are said to be in the sky. The birds are said to be in the heavens, and the stars are said to be in the heavens. In English, we use those words interchangeably, both for atmosphere and for space, and the Bible uses the word heaven to describe both sky, blue sky, and space. Near space, deep space, all of it can be referred to as heaven or the heavens. Uh, notice Genesis 1.15. Let them, the, the stars, the moon, etc., 
Uh, let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Uh, there you have stars in the heavens. And then in verse 20, God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. What does heaven mean? That's where the birds fly in this context. Heaven is not just describing the physical universe around us, space and sky above us, but heaven is also used to describe the spiritual realm which transcends our physical universe. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 10 in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul here is describing one of God's purposes for the church. And one of those purposes in Ephesians 3 is to demonstrate his wisdom, love, care, kindness to an audience. That audience is the spiritual powers um, above. And he calls them in verse uh, 310. Um, he says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church <coughs> excuse me, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What are those heavenly places? That is the spiritual realm, the non-physical dimension in which demons, the authorities and rulers that are uh, being talked about here, in which demons and also angels operate. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So we have heaven, the heavens, heavenly places, and in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul describes something that he calls the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, too, he just got describing all of the sufferings that he endures uh, in order to take the gospel to people who need to know the gospel. And then he describes his heavenly vision in chapter 12. He says, boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable. <laughs> I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, and Paul is talking about himself, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. He describes it further in verse 4. He says, I was caught up into paradise, and I heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Paul, tell us what you saw. Write a book about it. Um, only three verses are devoted to what Paul says. And basically what Paul says, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. He, he's not allowed to say what he experienced. He's not allowed to express what he heard. Really remarkable thing. And, and Paul calls this the third heaven. Why is it the third heaven? It's not sky where the birds are. It's not space where the stars are. Um, but it's the very throne room of God. Paradise of God. This throne room is where God dwells. This is the final use of the word heaven in our Bibles. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. And Revelation 12 is right in the middle of the Great Tribulation. And it comes about uh, at a future time in Earth's history where God will pour out his wrath on Earth dwellers over a period of seven years uh, and then really ramped up in the last three and a half years. The Antichrist is on the scene claiming to be Jesus. And God is dispensing his anger against those who dwell on the Earth. And in chapter 12, right in the middle of that, we have this description in verse 7. There was war in heaven, not in space, not in the sky but where God dwells. And Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, that's Satan, the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down. And this is clarified. He's the serpent of old who's called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth. 
And what's described after that is when he comes down to the earth, kicked out of heaven, no longer allowed access to God's throne room, um, he goes after the nation Israel during the tribulation and persecutes her and tries to wipe her out again. Uh, at the end of that chapter, we discover in verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman, that is Israel, and went off to make war with the rest of her children, that's Gentiles who follow Jesus during the tribulation. They're described as those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So, the reason we know that this being cast out of heaven is not some uh, primordial event before the fall of man in Genesis 3 or Genesis 2 and a half or something like that. Uh, because we know that Satan actually, during human history, after the fall, has access to the throne of God. We discovered that in Job chapter 1, did we not? That where Satan actually shows up before God in his throne room and makes appeal to God and wants to go after God's servant in order to discredit God's character and his promises. Of course, he's unsuccessful in doing that because any man of God, any man that God makes his own, God keeps. And not even Satan can thwart it. And then we also know that Satan is called not only the lion who roams about the earth seeking whom he may devour. Right? He's not yet bound. He will be bound when Jesus rules on his kingdom, but he's not yet bound. He's a lion who is seeking people to devour. And he is also called the accuser of the brethren. That is, he stands before God in God's throne room accusing you, believer, of all the things you're guilty of, but which God has counted you not guilty of. And maybe he's accusing you of some things you haven't done to. And in Revelation 12, he's no longer allowed to do that. He gets kicked out of heaven. Now, he's not removed from the spiritual realms, and he's not removed from the sky and from space, which are our universe. He's removed from the throne room of God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 9, um, when you pray, pray this. Our Father, who is where? In heaven. In heaven. You think, well, wait a second. I thought God was omnipresent. I thought he was everywhere all the time. I thought he was everywhere and everywhere. Yes, that's true. And God specially manifests his presence in heaven, in his dwelling place. Now, what the Old Testament will call the, the heavenly tabernacle, after which the earthly tabernacle and temple were modeled. There is a, a place called heaven where God specially manifests his presence. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. What do we see going on in heaven? That is God's specially present throne room where he's manifesting himself. This is Isaiah's report of being there. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty, exalted, and the hem of his robe, the, the tiniest little stitch of his robe, filled the temple. Isaiah, what did you see? Describe what did God look like? We don't get a description of God here. We get exaltedness, loftiness, the hem of a robe filling the temple. And then verse 2, seraphim stood above him. That doesn't mean they're higher in rank or authority. But stood above whatever it is Isaiah was experiencing. They're hovering. And seraphim is a Hebrew word that just means fiery ones. Fiery ones. Whether these are angels or some other special creature is not clear in this text. We may get a better idea uh, by a couple other texts. But these are fiery ones. Each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And, and the idea is that uh, with, with one set of wings, these fiery ones, before whose presence you and I would be terrified and would be tempted to worship them, they are putting a barrier between them and the manifest presence of a holy God. And, and they're covering their feet. Why feet? Feet are dirty, feet walk on ground. They're hovering because dirty feet can't be on this holy ground. Um, they're, they're covering their feet um, as honor and reverence before the Lord. And with two, they fly. 
They are hovering there around the throne room of God, around this manifest presence of the glory of God, and one seraph calls out to the other and says, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And there we see not only the omnipresence of God, the whole earth is full of his glory. He's everywhere all the time. And the special presence of God, he's right here, and we're declaring his holiness in this special manifestation of his holy presence. And it's interesting that these seraph, seraphim cry out, holy is Yahweh. Because these seraphim have never sinned. They're holy in the sense that they're separate from sin. They're separate from sinners. They don't have a sin nature. They've never done anything contrary to the will and glory of God. And yet they are calling out, holy is Yahweh. And the word holy just means different or separate. And there is an infinite separation between the seraphim and holy Yahweh. He is uncreated, independent. They are dependent creatures. In fact, you and I have much more in common with the seraphim as created beings than we do with God. And then we have something in common with God that they do not have. We are made in God's image with his stamp. So this is an interesting scene. These sinless seraphim hovering around the Lord, just consumed with interest, crying out, holy, holy, holy. And notice verse 4, the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Uh, the, the voices calling out are the seraphim voices. And the whole temple is shaking because of the thunderous voices of these seraphim. And they're the ones hiding their faces, hiding their feet, hovering over this holy ground, and crying out, holy, 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 it's Yahweh. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. I hope you're on a Bible reading plan that takes you through Ezekiel someday. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5, Ezekiel describes figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like a calf's hoof. They gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands. As for their faces and the wings of the four of them, their faces touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. They went straight forward. And then he goes on to describe uh, their, their form of different animals. Verse 11, uh, their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching the other being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. And he'll go on to describe their wheels and limbs uh, moving about in various directions. And emerald rainbows in this scene. And, and all of this in the very throne room of God. Now, I believe Isaiah and Ezekiel are describing the same creatures. And you think, wait a second, Ezekiel's had four wings, Isaiah's had six. Um, I think it's quite possible the creatures are having a, a set of the six wings tucked in so that Ezekiel doesn't see all of them. It's not exactly the same um, activities they're doing in Ezekiel 1 as Isaiah. But what's interesting, when you get to the book of Revelation, turn to Revelation 4, the, the same song, the same chorus, the Isaiah creatures in Isaiah 6 and the Ezekiel 1 creatures are saying over and over again is the same anthem that is being repeated in Revelation 4. And, and you have an interesting set of beings here. Verse 5 of Revelation 4. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which is the sevenfold spirit of God. 
And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third the face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, full of eyes, around and within, day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh, God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. These same creatures, these same four beings, these fiery ones with animal faces and eyes and wings, are crying out, holy, 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 in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 and Revelation 4 and 5. You get the impression that these four living creatures have a full-time occupation for thousands of years being enamored by the infinite glory and beauty of God himself. They get to be close to him, and they seem rather to enjoy this. And if you read the book of Revelation, you'll find out the four living creatures have some other responsibilities. They will say things, they will pronounce utterances. But they, they seem in these three scenes to be preoccupied with the glory of God from which they don't turn away. They, they, they don't go do other things. This is the throne room of God often referred to as heaven. Over and over again, you'll hear Jesus talk about your heavenly Father. Um, that is, God's special dwelling place is this throne room of God, which transcends the universe. This is outside of earth and space, all the way out to the pulsars and quasars. It's beyond that. It has location, but you can't exactly put an interstellar zip code on it. But it is a place where created beings who take up finite space dwell with the manifest presence of the glory of God. It's a place. And it is God's throne. When you and I use the word heaven, and the way we've used it in terms of this retreat, um, longing for our permanent residence, homesick for our permanent residence, heaven, we actually don't mean any of the things we've talked about yet. We typically mean the eternal state. The eternal state. Where you will be and what you will be doing in your glorified, resurrected, Jesus-resembling physical body forever and ever and ever, wherever that is. That's usually what we mean by heaven. It's too much to say. We can't just say that every time we want to talk about heaven. So we use the word heaven. And it's okay to use heaven that way. You need to understand that that's not the way the Bible uses heaven every time the word appears. Sometimes it's sky. Sometimes it's space. Sometimes it's the heavenly spiritual dimension where demons and angels operate. Sometimes it's the throne room of God. The very special manifest presence of the glory of God with the four living creatures and the angels. A place where Satan sometimes goes to accuse the brethren. And it is to that place that we appeal in prayer. And there is the eternal state. Jesus says in Matthew 6.20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Doesn't mean the atmosphere. It doesn't mean space. It doesn't even particularly mean the throne room of God, where God is now in heaven. But store up treasures for yourself to the eternal state where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. The eternal state, we can call the new heavens and new earth. It is the recreated order beginning in the last two chapters of your Bible. Revelation 21 and 22 describe the eternal state. And we'll talk more about that, a lot more about that this week. Just one note as a, a bit of a spoiler. The New Jerusalem, the city, is said to come down out of heaven onto the new earth in the new universe. 
And so Belinda Carlisle was almost right. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. <laughs> and, and yet, technically, she wasn't right there. I mean, she wasn't even thinking about biblical categories. Um, but even the words don't exactly fit. The New Jerusalem, the city of the people of God, and the dwelling place of God, and the very temple of God, God becomes the temple in that New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven and plant themselves on the new earth and a new universe. So Belinda Carlisle was right. I love Jesus' prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The throne room of God where God's will is done where his subjects love his glory, know his glory, are enraptured by his glory, and they do his bidding, and they love it, and there's no compromises. All of that is coming to all of God's created work. There are other phrases, of course, that are used to describe the eternal state of believers. Um, Paul describes our eternal glory in 2 Timothy 2.10. Romans 8.21 is a great phrase. All creation is longing, waiting expectantly, eagerly craning its neck, but waiting for the glory of the children of God. The, the created universe is strained even now, waiting for the children of God to enter into their glory. Glory is a good word to describe the eternal state. All right, session three. Turn the page. Let's talk about the duration of that. Oh, by the way, I meant to mention this earlier. Um, there are blank spaces for you to write questions. Uh, we're going to take some time this weekend to do some Q&A on heaven. Um, and if you'd like to write those questions down so that I get a peek at them ahead of time, that's nice. Uh, some of you have submitted a few to Anne. If you have a question this, this weekend that doesn't get answered in the normal flow of our sessions, we do want to take the opportunity to open our Bibles together. And um, we will say, I don't know, to a lot of your questions. And that's appropriate. Uh, but things that uh, are revealed to us in Scripture, we want to dig into. And so, uh, if, if you think of something, if anything I say prompts a question, um, feel free to just write those down. You can uh, bring those to me anytime in between, hand them to Anne, uh, and we'll my direction. The duration of heaven. The duration of heaven. You know the answer to this. How long is heaven? Well, that's forever. Um, Daniel 12.2 tells us that some are resurrected to everlasting life. Think about, think about that. What, what was Ponce de Leon after? Yeah, the fountain of youth. What is oil of Olay all about? <laughs> is that right? Is that brand new? From cosmetic surgery to uh, health products, the, the promise, the search, even to cryogenics, you know, you can uh, freeze yourself uh, in hopes that someday medical advancements will allow you to live longer down the road. I don't know if you really want to wake up in a world you don't recognize with people you don't know, but some people are freezing themselves. Um, people have started experimenting with freezing themselves in another way, freezing themselves digitally, putting their brain and its contents somehow digitized in their computer. Um, so that after they expire physically, uh, their information still exists. Some people want to live into posterity by uh, being a legend in this life and, and their memories go on and on. But there are a lot of different ways that people try to think about everlasting life or, or increasing the duration of life. I don't know about you, but the longer I live in a fallen, cursed world, that doesn't sound so good. And I'm not advocating checking out. We have things to do here. But this isn't home. 
And there is an everlasting life to which believers will be resurrected. The, the corollary in Daniel 12, 2 is some are resurrected to everlasting contempt. That is, under the wrath of God in hell. John 17, 3, we'll reference this verse a number of times this weekend. But Jesus defined eternal life for us as knowing God. Knowing God is eternal life. Eternal life is just an interesting phrase. Life that is eternal. The Bible's very clear about this. Heaven lasts forever. Turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. There, Jesus makes a promise to the church at Ephesus. And when he says, to him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, he is also making a <coughs> promise to us who believe in any age. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I will grant him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Um, there is going to be a tree... In heaven, we'll look at that later this morning, um, that is called the tree of life. If we go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 3, verse 22, describes this tree of life that God actually planted in the garden where Adam and Eve were in their sinless but not permanent state. So Adam and Eve were sinless in the garden, fellowshipping with God, and there was this tree. After the fall in Genesis 3, uh, inter-Trinitarian conversation here, then, verse 22, then Yahweh God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. And he doesn't mean like one of me and the four living creatures, or one of me and the angels, but one of us as in Trinitarian persons. And he says, knowing good and evil, and now man might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. But there the tree of life in the Garden of Eden um, was a, a physical, tangible emblem of the gift of God to created beings to sustain them forever. It wasn't a magic tree. The, the fruit wasn't magic fruit that somehow if you ate it, it just kept going. It's not like the fountain of youth or something like that. Uh, but it is a very tangible way in the Garden of Eden to demonstrate that God, the giver of all things, upon whom all creatures are dependent, God was giving life that never ended. And Adam and Eve weren't allowed that anymore. You, you, you eat of the knowledge of the, of the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, you will die. The one who sins must die. The wages of sin is death. You, you don't have access to the tree of life, but for the one who is forgiven, for the one who is declared by God to be absolutely righteous, to be in God's judicial court, considered as if she had never sinned, and if she had always done everything right, that one gets to be in the paradise of God and gets access to the tree of life. That is... Again, not some magical fruit. You know, every three weeks you need to go eat a piece of fruit or else you're going to die in heaven. Uh, the point is, it's a, a physical, tangible emblem of God sustaining life forever for those who belong to Him. Um, how long is heaven? It is eternal life. It, we get access to the tree of life. It is everlasting life. In Revelation 21.4 you get this refrain, there is no longer this, no longer that. Listen to this list. God wipes away every tear. There will no longer be any death, no longer be any mourning, no crying, no pain. The first things have passed away. A staggering statement. Everything that you and I have experienced up to this point falls under the category of first things. Even when Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand years with Satan bound, it's going to be the best period of time human history has ever known up to this point. That is still considered part of the first things. That occurs in Revelation 20. New heavens and new earth comes in Revelation 21. That's when the new things come. The first things have 
first things pass away, Revelation 21 4. <coughs> Thomas Watson, in his theology book called A Body of Divinity, tried to describe eternity. And he said it this way, imagine that all the earth and, and, and all of the atmosphere of the earth, up to the highest part of our atmosphere, if the entire thing were sand, from the core of the earth all the way out to the, the troposphere, we were all sand. And every 10,000 years, a small bird flew from the outer reaches of space, flapped its little wings, and flew to the earth and picked up one-tenth of a grain of sand in its little beak and flapped all the way out to the edge of the universe and deposited that little grain, a tenth of a grain of sand. 10,000 years later, flaps his little wings and comes back and picks up another tenth of a grain of sand. And deposit. When, when all of the sand that was this orb is deposited in that place, eternity will have only just begun. And that illustration is silly. It, 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 the math doesn't even work. It, there's no way for us to compute the immensity of infinity, of eternity, of forever, of always, of everlasting. And for some of you, that that probably feels scary and disturbing. Like, I, I don't know if I can handle something that's that long. I don't know if my heart can, can take the, the thought of such immensity. It, it's actually kind of terrifying. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with things here. And, and for something that is mysterious and, and unknown and I haven't experienced yet, for that to go on and, and on and on, like a tenth of a grain of sand, a blue ten thousand miles away. Oh, I don't know if I want that. I, maybe I want to stay here. Do you ever feel that way? Have you ever thought about the math? There are a couple of ways to, to think about eternity, and these phrases come off of our lips. Will this ever end? You know when you say that? When you have a cold or a headache or, or some physical malady or some trial or, or traffic or... It's like, oh, will this ever end? No, and when you think about something like that, eternity is, oh, man. I don't like eternity. But when you're having the the best experience of your life where every relationship is as it should be and, 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 and the meals are just exquisite and you're laughing and the sun is out and it's not 117, it's like 78 and <laughs> you're in San Diego or if you like the mountains, you're in somewhere else and, and it's just perfect. I was uh, watching my son's baseball practice the other night and it was that temperature. You know that temperature where you can't feel it? Yeah. It's just perfect. It's like, wait, am, am I warm or am I cool? I don't know. <laughs> it's like San Diego in Arizona. It just happened. The light really was just exquisite. Those days when you say, oh, I hope this never ends. Now I can get my heart around that kind of eternity. Where the, where the best experiences are multiplied by that sideways eight, that infinity sign. And even that does not get us around what heaven is. Because when the finite human mind appropriates one more angle on the multifaceted nature of an infinite God, then, oh, now is better than then. <laughs> And you turn another corner and you discover something else about God's universe and, and how, it, how it glorifies his mind. You discover something else about God's self-giving nature and, and how he just gives and gives and gives to his creatures who don't deserve it again. And you just think, oh, what am I doing here? I can't, I can't believe this. And, and day 26 trillion, 983 billion, 874,964 is better than whatever number came before that. <laughs> and tomorrow is going to be better still. It, it will be 
be too good to be true, and it will be true. All right, turn the page. Where is heaven? What is the location of heaven? We talked about the throne room of God transcending the universe. Where is it right now? We get an interesting picture in Genesis with that story of Jacob's ladder, Jacob's dream, where the, the angels of God are ascending and descending on the earth. And, and you get this idea, there's, is this a wormhole? Is this like a beanstalk? You know, do, do you think fairy tale or do you think sci-fi? Everybody's different. Um, but, but there's some corridor, some, some means of transport where heavenly beings come down here and interact on this terrestrial orb. Um, so heaven is a, is a place, it, it's a dwelling place, it's, it's beyond the universe, it's where God's manifest presence is, it's where those four living creatures are, it's where they cry out, holy, 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 it's where the angels show up for duty. But we also know that the angels of God, uh, Hebrews 1 tells us, are sent by God to be servants of those who are redeemed, those who are inheritors of salvation. And so they come to earth. And there have been times throughout human history when there's those angels and those demons have taken on physicality. They've taken on physical form. Um, even God himself, before Bethlehem, takes on physical form. Probably the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity, whose name isn't Jesus until Bethlehem, but it's Jesus, it's the Christ who comes, but he's the second person of the Trinity, the, the Son of God who comes and wrestles with Jacob in physical form. Uh, it's not a non-physical sort of spirit entity Jacob is wrestling with, but a man. And, and over and over again in the Old Testament, you, you, you get the, the transcendent, extra-dimensional spiritual entities, persons, beings, interacting physically here. Like angels wiped out 165,000, 185,000 Assyrians um, in 2 Kings and and so um, there is a place, and, and from this place, these beings transport. Jesus himself said when he was on the earth, I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. Um, Jesus said in John 17, and we'll look at this one in more detail later today, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, John 14, 1 3. I go to prepare a place for you. Um, so where Jesus goes after the death, burial, and resurrection, he ascends where? To the right hand of the Father where he makes intercession on behalf of believers. And that is the place where Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you, in my Father's house are many, what? Mansions. Many rooms or many mansions, depending on the translation you're looking at. We think of a mansion, and we think of, man, that's a big house with many rooms. God has a house with many mansions. And when Jesus left the earth, he went there to prepare a place for you. And if you ever listen to Keith Green, you may have heard him say this. God created the universe in six days. And for nearly 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place for you. It must be great. He could do it instantly. Jesus has gone there, back to heaven, to prepare a place for us. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, the very end of it. Revelation 20, verse 11, we see Jesus himself seated on the great white throne for judgment of all of the wicked dead. Believers will not be there. This is the lineup of unbelievers answering for their crimes before a holy God. And before this one who sits on the throne, 
from his presence, verse 11, earth and heaven fled away and no place was found. This is the point in time when history ends and the universe dissolves. Peter tells us that it dissolves at the elemental level being burned up by fire. And the whole universe goes away. But the place that Jesus has gone, John 14, 1 to 3, to prepare a place for us, this new Jerusalem that comes down out of the throne room of God onto the new earth in Revelation 21, it is there now and it is a place. And when the universe is destroyed, that place comes down to new geography, the new heavens and the new earth. Hebrews 11, 16 tells us that saints are looking forward to a better country. It is a city, a country, a place. And Jesus said in Luke 23, 42, that it is a paradise. Paradise. And paradise evokes in our minds the, the, the thoughts of a, of a perfect place. It is a Persian word. And interestingly, it's the Persian word in, in, in Persia. Um, very close to ancient Mesopotamia. Um, it, very likely that that's where humanity originated and man was created and the Garden of Eden was. You're not going to go find it today. Um, but um, interestingly, that the Persians picked up this word paradise and it's come into English. And it means something like an exquisite cultivated garden. That's just a, an interesting leftover from, from the very beginnings of human history in the Persian language. And so everything that God has prepared for believers, everything that Jesus promises for believers, he promised it to the thief next to him on the cross, who in his dying agony places faith in Christ. And he promises it to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2, and to all who belong to him in Ephesians 2, you will have access to the tree of life in the paradise of God. It is a real, physical place where the redeemed will live in God's glorious, manifest presence forever. We'll stop there and let's sing.